And we are back. We've got it all sorted out. Still online with us is Carolyn French Sandiford. If you're just joining us, we are dissecting what happens when the leadership changes in political parties and uh, taking a look at what took place on Sunday uh, in the United Democratic Party. Carolyn, so uh, let me ask my question again, just uh, going into Sunday's convention. What were some of the things, uh, what were your expectations, things you were looking at? Tell me. Absolutely. And as I was saying earlier, that most political analysts would have been looking either way, simply because of all the circumstances that were leading into the convention. One was expecting certain changes in terms of alliances. As we always know, politics and alliance can be very fluid. Yeah. And um, one can recall, of course, in February that um, John Saldiva won handsomely. Um, it was a 60 to 40% um, win. Mm -hmm. And then moving into the, this convention, of course, there were many issues surrounding his candidacy. And you started to see in that last three, three or four days, I think, um, uh, uh, some ads coming out talking about hope yeah and getting a sense that the issue became one of who is better for the image of the party and who can be the only hope for the party because one candidate came with baggage and another i wouldn't say they didn't come with baggage but maybe not as much baggage yeah. but you are still getting a sense that there were still some loyalists um linked to um John Saldiva, they were still coming out, but clearly it was not as it was in the previous convention. Yeah. And so you couldn't call it necessarily, but you could have seen whereby somewhere between Friday and Saturday, some calls probably met, some alliances were forged, and there was this 20% swing that moved into giving Patrick Farber um, the win. Yeah. I think one of the things we must recognize in leadership conventions, Marlene and Gavin, is that it is not just about selecting a leader. The stakes are very, very high. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about power. You're talking mm -hmm. about controlling a billion dollars in um, government revenues and budget. You're talking about controlling, in our instances, some 17,000 square miles of land and sea. So the post of a party leader, then the, there's a probability that that party leader is going to be prime minister. And so clearly, there are certain people in, in politics that benefit depending on who they are supporting and where their loyalty lies. Yeah. And so it's war, it's contentious, but at the end of the day, they emerge as a leader. You know, and I, that's actually kind of what I wanted to talk about because the mere fact that there is an election, and especially in the circumstances of this one where a few months ago there was a winner and now persons have switched alliances or whatever, and yes. uh, it, speaks to a, uh, it speaks to a bigger issue in relation to leadership when we think of what, what is the person going to have to do to now unify uh, the party, yes. and this has um, this has been an issue that's popped up several times over the years in different political parties, where there's a new leader. How do how does that end up? How does that usually play out in terms of actually being the focus of unity um, for the party? You're quite right, um, Gavin, and I think history can can teach us a lot. I think this particular convention, clearly, when you look at the um, figures. Um, it is really right down the middle. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there was a 20% swing. Yes, uh, Patrick Farber was able to garner, I think, some 59 delegates, the vote, um, votes from 60, 59 delegates to create that swing um, in his favor. But it's right down the line. And whenever you have that clear down the line, it's telling you your party has a major major um, fissure yeah. and how you move forward in terms of creating that unity of course the hill is steeper yeah. if you look back at um, the leadership convention for example for the people's united party um, in 1996 as far as i recall it was a 60 40 
And so you ended up then with someone who had a clear majority. Interestingly, it's almost, almost as to what John Saldiva had in the first convention. Yeah. And the then um, party leader, the, the Honorable Said Musa, was able to create uh, an, an energy trust bringing on young people, his brains trust, if I can put it that way, create this great team and this great energy and move into an overwhelming victory. But be mindful that he was, the PUP was then in opposition. Mm -hmm. This is the first time actually that we are having a leadership convention where the political party um, that is having the convention is in government. And it was interesting when I heard the Prime Minister speak to staying on for the rest of his tenure. Because normally, if you look at the tradition of political parties in the Caribbean, Jamaica in, in particular, both in the cases of change of leadership, while the party was in government, there was a handing over um, to the successor. Because let us face it, there can be two leaders at the table there can only be one leader so it was interesting that the, the the prime minister indicated that and i think in his wisdom he has been winning elections since 2008 um he probably factored in to my mind more so the issue that you raised just now of unity because despite what all has transpired within the united democratic party yeah. one can commend the Right Honorable Dean Barrow for holding a party together from 1998 to 2008 when they actually um, got into government. Because if you may recall, the then um, Right Honorable Manuel Esquivel resigned. Mm -hmm. So that issue then becomes a very key issue as to how one unifies the party. If you're right down the middle, clearly the hill is steeper than if you ended up with a majority. Yeah. You know, I, I'm so grateful for uh, the history lesson that you can provide because I, I think we, we all closely watched what took place um, in February and then on Sunday. Yes. And when you see a political party um, become so divided, it almost seems that it's impossible that they're going to get it all together before. And so my question really has to do with timing. The example that you used um, in, in history is the uh, Musa Marin Convention back in the 90s, which was also a very hotly debated uh, leadership convention from what I've read and understood. Um, and also, uh, you know, it took some time to build back the party. But the timing between them is, is what's going to make a difference. How much time after that leadership convention uh, did uh, M Mr. Musa have in being able to, to get ready for the next election? Given the fact that you said they were in yeah. opposition at that time, yes. we are looking at four months maybe, maybe more, um, absolutely. before the next election. Yeah, absolutely. But it is not only four months. Um, it is also a challenging time for Belize because if you realize yeah. we're we are experiencing an economic downturn that is having um, serious implications to the livelihoods, to the health, um, the yeah. social well-being of a nation. Um, in addition, um, the COVID um, pandemic is not going to go away in this anytime soon. Yeah. Um, so clearly, you're dealing with a leadership that has to be doing two things. You have to be talking about organizing and mobilizing your party at a time when you've been there for 12 years, so clearly there's some fatigue that has set in, yeah. even the electorate. You see, what, what, what tends to happen over time, Marlene and Gavin, is that people tend to lose sight and lose focus in terms of what may have brought that party into government. Mm -hmm. There is a new generation of, of, of voters, there's a new generation of thinkers. So the longer you move away from what led you to your victory, the more people start to put the, 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 um, the glass on you, uh, the magnifying glass on you. So your, your, your issues, your, um, the, the, the mis I wouldn't say the uh, mistakes per se, but the acts that you may have done 
that people start to look at and start saying, oh, well, this party is corrupt, this party is this, this party is that. It starts to be elevated more, and what the reason for your getting in or attacking the other party starts to be downplayed more. Mm -hmm. And so you will have the issue of fatigue, you will have the issues of whatever um, allegations of corruption, uh, mismanagement, um, personal Ill, um, wealth gain, and these kinds of issues, these are going to be amplified a bit more. So you have to deal with that. You have to deal with the fatigue. And then you also have to start talking about how do I energize my party? Mm -hmm. Because with a split right down the middle, um, you're talking about half of the party basically saying that they yeah. were not supporting um, they were not supporting you. They're still supporting another candidate. Yeah. So clearly, um, John Saldiva is going to play, in my opinion, a major role in what move, how, how they move forward. If we look back at the PUP time in office, um, at that time, they had two years, 1996. Yeah. Um, and at that time, the they then um, leadership of Said Musa had the support of the Honorable John Briseño. Mm -hmm. And so with that support coming out of the North, North. that sort of neutralized the challenge or the continued challenge one would have had, say, from the Honorable Fons Florence Marine, who did not, as far as I can see and I am aware, did not become a torn, so to speak, <laughs> in um, the right in the other other side, in the side. At least it, it didn't appear that way. And he was able to mobilize, organize, but be mindful that his mobilization and organization was also inspirational and motivational. Yeah. He was putting out ideas, great ideas that inspired the nation. Mm -hmm. um, you had a lot of uh, meetings and, and trains and um, all these um, people's assembly and they were presenting their ideas and people were becoming motivated and, and energized. Yeah. That was two years. Yeah. Um, in this case, you're talking, like you said, about four months. So there's multiple things on the table. Yeah. And how the new leader is able to navigate that, that, that path will be heavily, and how successful he will be, will be heavily dependent, in my opinion, on one, the current prime minister, the right honorable Dean Barrow, how much he is able to continue to hold the party together Mm -hmm. even at a time when you're talking alliance and um, how fluid alliance is because people are also recognizing that he's on his way out yeah. so his sway may not necessarily be as it would have been in the first instance because he's and you're now looking for alliances um with the new leadership because remember never forget marlene and gavin this is really about power Mm -hmm. It's about who is going to control the resources and who is going to benefit from these resources. Mm -hmm. So you now need to start thinking of how you align yourselves and who you align yourselves with. And I think that becomes the key challenge. Um, that becomes one of the key challenges for the current leader. Let me, let me just And you ask, have a shorter time to yeah, do it. I, yeah, I'm very short. Um, and in the strangest circumstances we have all lived yes, in. Exactly. But, but I want to go back to, to looking at what happened in February. Because, yes. you know, some may say now that uh, Honorable, uh, that uh, Saldiva lost because of what took place in court. But it is really difficult to be able to, to look at the context of February and not recognize that perhaps all the doubts and the cloud was, I mean, about to burst with all the rain, all the evidence was there. Yeah. It was simply a matter of, of having a name mentioned in the court. Um, and yet he was able to have such a successful win. Um, so it says a lot about whatever uh, his opponent or the challenges that his opponent faced. We saw a lot of the issues um, being used in the campaign in February, focusing primarily on the character of yes. Honorable Faber. And, and, you know, the words that were used to describe him were petty. Um, yeah. And so... Vindictive. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we still saw that for this convention yeah. in some of the communication that was coming out. So the fact that it was still such a narrow win, what does that yeah. say? What does that indicate? 
It, it could indicate a number of things. I think one, the issue of um, John Saldiva, I think the party, in my opinion, did not manage it well. I believe that you had a convention and someone convincingly win. This was not a narrow win. This was a blowout win. Um, and then that person is asked, or forced, if we can put it either way, to resign based on certain revelations that came out of a, of a court and so on and so forth. And then you now call the new convention and you are allowing that person to run again. And to use the words as to say, well, the ethics committee did not see anything illegal that he has done. Well, there is ethics and there is law. There is always the perception of things. And clearly there was some perception in the general populace that there are issues that, um, that the Honorable Saldiva was associated with, which some people, and I use the word some, saw as not being good for the image of the party. But that in itself did not say to them, if we are moving into a new leadership convention, this person must, um, must, must, uh, must not run. By the mere fact they did that, they were saying that they were also in some way condoning that perception or belief, um, and, and just accepting it as a perception and then if you're and allowing the person to run, it's saying, well, despite all that, it is okay. But then if you then say that, then why have another convention, which then compromises the legitimacy of the convention? And even at this convention, yeah. um, you see the following or the support. That points also to some cynicism mm -hmm. in that what has transpired with the Honorable John Saldiva, the UDP is quite correct. It has not been any legal issue. He has not been accused of anything. Yeah. Um, and therefore, they, 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 there are certain people within the party saying, well, if he has not been accused of anything, um, this is the person we wanted. Why is it that uh, we just don't allow, um, have, him, um, have him be the leader? So they went back to ex make that expression at the convention. So like I said, I believe the party handled it wrong. If yeah. you're going to have another convention, he ought not to have run. By having him run, run send a, uh, did not send a good message because, like I said, it does compromise the legitimacy of that convention. Yeah. And, you know, that mm -hmm. speaks to uh, the wider issue that you did touch on slightly, but we can delve into it more. Uh, and that's the issue of public perception because when we're talking about a leadership convention, we're really talking about something in, internal. Mm -hmm. But yes. we know, and especially because we're due for an election sometime soon, that public perception is arguably going to be the biggest factor that, or the, mo the, the most weighty factor leading up into the election itself. So yes. how do, how the, in terms of the public then, when they notice one, the, the issues that surrounded the candidates which have been brought out, and now two, there's also um, an image however correct or wrong it is, of this unity within the party, what position then is the new leader in going forward? Um, you know, how does, how does that, how does the, you know, now Honorable Patrick Faber, how does he keep it together yeah. on the road to the election? <laughs> well, you know, Gavin and Marlene, there's always a saying of an easy lies the head that wears the crown. Yeah. Yes? And I think if we even go back to look at history, let mm. us look at the People's United Party Convention of 2008, mm -hmm. where we had a similar um, scenario, so to speak, where it was uh, almost a 50-50 between the then um, Honorable um, John Briseño and the then Honorable Francis Fonseca. Yeah. And history records, of course, that at some point, the Honorable John Briseño decided to call it quits for the time being. Of course, he has returned triumphant um, at, a, at a subsequent convention. But what you saw then, the two factions at odds, because yeah. go back to the point that I keep point saying, this is about power. Yeah. Don't fool yourself. 
don't be naive to it's think that this is about loving. It's not just a fancy title. Yes, this is about loving the people and, mm-hmm. and wanting to help the poor. And so it may not, it doesn't necessarily be that some people genuinely want to do that. I'm not saying no. But the bottom line is about power and your alliances and, and, and who, who is going to control that power is going to control the resources of this country. And so what you found out in the POP, for example, and I was party chairman um, during the period 2000, um, 2010, there was a constant bucking of factions, so mm-hmm. to speak. Now, when we went into the, and this is just some, some little history, we went into the 2016 elections and clearly um, we had three strong contenders and of course the honorable john um, Bresenio, um won again but there was a difference in how we voted be mindful that we had over t- now over 2700 um delegates or the pup voted um they had over 2700 delegates vis-a-vis 570. so it was a broad and deeper democracy so that's one two um, while the Honorable John Bersenio, um did not reach half, by teaming up with the Honorable Cordell Hyde, he consolidated that two-thirds majority. So he has a very strong uh, majority and a, a strong majority to lead. So everybody else has to fall in line. Um, when it comes to now the UDP, there is really not that third faction, so to speak, because so these 10 votes is neither here nor there, particularly since he has said he is, he is resigning. Mm-hmm. But the opportunity is there for the current leader to shake things up. And it may very well be that um, it may not be in time. Maybe it may be. It all depends on, on, on how he can um, bring it. But again, at the end of the day, like I said, without that strong majority and, and, and boil right down the line, the issue become this hill becomes steeper. But a second thing I want to point out, Marlene and Gavin, is that unfortunately our political parties are no longer strong on ideology. Mm-hmm. Because if you were strong on ideology, at the end of the day, the party becomes the gatekeeper and the check and balance of the ideological underpinnings of the party. Mm-hmm. So regardless of who that leader is, you are going to be on board because it becomes a team effort. When you have your ideology um, not so strong, and to my mind, it's weak, and it's very weak in the UDP because um, they themselves have never been able to articulate some ideology as to what they stand for. If you listen to any of the leaders of the UDP, their issue has always been that PUP is the enemy. So they come on board with a fight that PUP is the enemy. Um, at the end of the day, in a sort of PUDP system, sometimes like they like to say that we may be in <laughs> now, that in itself may not necessarily be strong enough to hold a party. You are you coalesce around an ideology. You coalesce yeah. about the values, something that you believe in, because it's what you believe in is supposed to guide and lead you. So ideology can also play a place in terms of how the leader moves forward. Um, is then it that the party has a strong ideology that the, then those factions that are saying, well, we don't support you and Marlene, you brought out that point very clearly when you said there were people who from the onset were saying this is not somebody who can lead us. In fact, said Elrington went on record to say neither of them could lead him. So he put himself um, in. <laughs> so if you, if half of the party is saying they don't, believe in your leadership, that the trust and confidence is not there in your leadership, then that that pathway is going to be very unstable and you're constantly going to be watching and saying, who is going to come in for the crown? I, I want to I wanna jump in on something you said there, Carolyn. I know we've had the conversation before um, about the fact that there's uh, very little to distinguish our major political parties. There are more than two, but they're two major political parties here. And at this point and in this day and age, the difference is red or blue or the historical families that have been tied uh, to these these parties. And when you talk about ideology, um, I think oftentimes that that's part of what we don't hear in the conversation when people make their criticisms or or express concerns of our two-party system. 
But earlier in this conversation, you said something, and I think we, we just don't talk about it enough. Is it that our electorate is changing? When, when you hear people creating and using and talking about the PUDP term, is it that they are becoming a bit more mature, a bit more, um, <laughs> or just being, having better expectations of our political parties? Because you're right. At one point in time, the PUP, and, and this is only because of my, my history classes in school, were, were founded on, on uh, it was social justice, right? That's right. Um, I, I'm not sure what the UDP's uh, vision was at, at their starting, but the point is that, you know, when we look at the U.S., I mean, no liberals or, or conservatives, and in other parts of the world, there's kind of a clear defined um, thrust of where yes. these political parties were, want to go. We don't really have that in our party yeah. systems today. And what happens when the electorate, as we're seeing now, starts to demand it? Yeah. And I think you, 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 you alluded to something also, because the electorate has also become cynical and disillusioned. Mm -hmm. Because it's like um, we make the changes that we think we ought to make when we go to the polls, but what we realize is that those changes have not really manifested or the election, um, the voting that I engaged in has not necessarily manifested in those changes. One of the, the, the um, unique feature of Caribbean politics, of which Belize is a part, is what they call the, the winners take it all mentality, yeah. where when you're in a position, the government is thief, they're corrupt, they're the worst things on the space of the earth, and you are going to be the messiah. And when you come in, you are going to change. In fact, to use the, the current prime minister word, it, in a whiff of corruption, he was going to have a machete and chop everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you're in opposition, that's what you do. And then when you get in, the one who now comes out to opposition, the cycle starts again. Yeah. They start to talk about who thief, who corrupt, who mismanage, and they're going to be the savior. But the reality, it's a winner's all mentality. And that winner's all mentality has a way of affecting the policies that, of, of state. And therefore, the wealth of this nation is not necessarily distributed as it ought to. And that was a difference of the social justice regime. When the social justice philosophy is anchored in your party, you start looking at things a bit differently. You start looking at the wealth and to see how is it that it can be equitably shared um, that is when you have the land reform, um, the, the um, issues of um, supporting small farmers, um, small business. That is when you have issues of housing, education, and so on and so forth. When you look at the history of the Right Honorable George Price, and I have to mention people like Madame Gwendolina Lizaraga, mm -hmm. who took it upon themselves and said, hey, we cannot educate just the families of the rich, we must educate the families of the poor because education is the means by which we get afford mobility. And so that's how you start getting public schools, because before that, they were all private or church state um, schools. Land reform in the north, where farmers got access to all those sugar cane lands at the time when sugar was, was, was king. Um, it didn't happen in the south, and that's why you see big banana, big growers in the south, because that did not happen when that land reform process was taking place. So my point is that when you're anchored in that kind of philosophy, then the issue is not so much about personalities. In our politics today, it has become a lot about personalities, not necessarily ideology. And I'm hopeful yeah. that the political parties start seeing ideology and philosophy as so very important because that is what makes a strong political party and a strong democracy. Mm -hmm. You see, it's not about who thief and who corrupt. It's going to be about other things, um, including that, yes, because they are talking about corruption and mismanagement and wastage, but it is also going to be about how the wealth best serves the good of the community. And I think that is absent, and so we get into the personality conflicts. The yeah. issue is also human nature, Marlene and Gavin. Um, John Saldiva went into an election. I have no doubt both candidates spent an enormous amount of money going into these um, into the conventions, both the one February and this one. Um, he won convincingly, regardless of all that cloud that you said. 
-hmm. and now to be forced to go back into another one and losing by 19 that's a personal issue mm -hmm. and human nature is what it is so it will take more than just calling Jan Zaliva and say hey um you know let us work this out um pupi is the enemy mm -hmm. um you know, we need it, to, to join is forces. Is it also it common fun. that you get threats of people who are going to leave the party? Because that's what we're hearing um, right yes. now. Um, is, is this all par for the course that, you know, there, there's a change in leadership? Some say, oh, well, we're going to leave. And there's a concern because, well, they usually have secure <laughs> seats. <laughs> I think the next, um, the next two weeks are going to be interesting because okay. that is when all the meetings are going to take place. Okay. As to see who is going to be around the table if the party should win the election. Mm. Again, as I said, alliances are fluid. It's politics. It's about power. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things um, that I, I do believe, though, there will be those that who will say, well, you know, at the end of the day, um, we need to stay in power because they know what it is to be in power. They are, they, they are hungry to stay there because they understand the benefits of being in power. Uh, and there will be others, perhaps like Sede, who will say and call a spade a spade. And who is going to say, I can no longer be a part of something that is not good for beliefs. Mm -hmm. Because in his own way, he has indicted the party that he has been a part of the government for 12 years by saying that it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And he don't want to see himself a part of that. So those are indictments that you're going to have. Some of them are going to be personal, yeah. and some of them are going to be philosophically grounded. Um, whatever we may want to say about the honor of the Sede Elvington, and I have always said this, that we may not like certain things that he has said. You know, the artificial border, the fact that the fish don't know if they're not from Guatemala, Belize, that kind of thing. And there was nothing wrong in really what he was saying. But it, it didn't come off the way that people, it, it was a palatable to people. But there was not much in terms of corruption or mismanagement that surrounded him. So regardless of what one may want to say, there's a when fish come from river bottom and tell you the fish think you may want to take kid. So I think these are some of the issues that currently that we'll have to start looking at. Yeah. There is a, you've been there for 12 years. There are some um, issues that have, have plagued the party. The prime minister is about to leave. Um, what is it that you're going to do to change the image of the party? While at the same time, look at the governance side of things. What is it that you have done? that really sets you apart or set um, the party apart because you now have a political party on the other side who is hungry for power too. Mm -hmm. They have been out of the fray for 12 years, you see? And so they themselves are hungry for power. And so, it all, so it's going to be a, a, a battle and it's going to be who can convince the Belizean people not only that change is imminent, but really that what is going to happen is going to benefit them. And you're talking about a cynical, like I said, and a mm -hmm. disillusioned um, um, electorate. Yeah. And even if you take um, that existing cynicism, one of the biggest things, if not the biggest things that we can't ignore is the current circumstances that the country and indeed the world is facing exactly. due to um, the pandemic. Of course, the economic issues and you know the general issues that um, or the, or the general fallout that has happened because of the pandemic. What do you think um, is going to be the most important message that a political party or leader are going to have to send in order to be successful? I mean, because if you look at history as well, you see that um, perhaps there have been changes in, in in political party and government due to certain external exigencies. In this case, yeah. we have a pandemic which is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are feeling sort of unsettled, anxious. So what does, what, what based on your knowledge and, and, and of history and also of just taking the current temperature, do you yeah. think is going to be the biggest um, issue or the biggest message that will need to be sent? The biggest message that can be sent Gavin and Marlena is hope. People must have hope yep. that things are going to be better for them. Um, when you send a message of hope that inspires and motivates, people will come on board. Mm -hmm. When you create spaces for people to, to hear that hope, when you connect that hope to them, people are going to come on board. What is, has been happening to Belize, and it's not just Belize, it's many other countries, you find that that 
loyal, that base that you would say stick to the blue and stick to the red, that base has been dwindling. Mm -hmm. And there really is a rise of independent voters. Yeah. And with the use of media, social media platforms, um, right now, you don't I don't need Channel 5, I don't need Channel 7, I don't need Reporter, Mandala. I don't need radio station to share my message. I can create a My Facebook Live, I can do multiple platforms, yeah. and I can get out there and, 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 and bring a message. So young, the, young, the new people, the young people, the new generation of thinkers, they are looking at what is going to be down the road. And I think whatever message any political party sends, yeah. It has to be a message that gives hope that things are going to change and that the majority of the people in this nation is going to benefit. I like to call it deliver on the peaceful, constructive Belizean revolution. Because that revolution was supposed to bring to all Belizeans a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. People were supposed to share the wealth of this nation. When you have blatant inequality in this country, then I think COVID-19 exposed it for us. Yeah. 80,000 people applying for unemployment out of about 130 to 40,000 people. Said a lot about where we are. What is concerning for me is that the longer the pandemic, the more the dependency syndrome. And that in itself can play an, have an impact. But the message that has to come is that there is hope, that there's hope that's going to change. And how that hope is going to deliver on that revolution that said we were supposed to benefit you have to garner that trust and confidence back in government. People have lost faith. They've lost trust and confidence in government. They're seeing that nothing is changing. I've listened to Chester a little earlier. Uh, people tend to seem that you're not really going after who are the criminals, the white collar ones, especially who have raped this country. Um, that is what people yeah. want to know, that there's going to be hope that those who have raped this country is going to be held accountable for it yeah. and more importantly that they and themselves are going to realize the dream my great grandmother i always remember say her saying to me that she joined the revolution not for her but for her children and her great grandchildren and i think if we can get the message out regardless a message of hope of change of deliverance of that revolution and what that revolution is going to mean to people, I think people can begin to once again believe. Yeah. It won't be a, 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 a quick fix, mm -hmm. it will take time. Oh, absolutely. You know, Caroline, as you watch and you pay attention to how people talk um, online and, and even in, in casual speak if you're in a public space, there is an exhaustion in this country of the inequities that exist. Um, and I think that when you, when you talk about giving a message of hope, there, there needs to be an inspiration for change and, and believe that leaders want to adopt it wholeheartedly. It, it really brings me to another point, and, and it may seem far-fetched. I saw quite a bit of momentum building from um, at least the online platforms for candidates like uh, Daryl Bradley. Now I know political analysts like yourself had a very different view from the start as to how that was going to go and not surprised at all that he had left the, the, um, the convention race and even if he had gone in, many had said if you were uh, well seasoned in politics, there was no way it was going to happen. And mm -hmm. that's, and I'll give you the opportunity to explain why, um, but it really is because there is the party um, and how that works. And then there's what people on the outside of these parties have an expectation for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think what was interesting, and I, I recall when Darrell was making a comment, he said people were saying to him that, well, he doesn't have a seat mm -hmm. um, in the House. Now, I think it goes back again to our political education. Yeah. Uh, Marlene and Gavin, I'm not sure if you are aware, but when Manuel Esquivel became the leader of the United Democratic Party in 1983. He didn't have a seat in the House, you know. He was a yeah. senator. Mm -hmm. You okay. see, just like Darrell is a senator. Because to be a leader of the party does not require you to have a seat in the House. George Price was leader of the party in 1984 to 89. He didn't have a seat in the House. The leader of a party and a leader of opposition in the house are two different things. Yeah. 
two different things. And I think in that particular case, but in 1983, let me, sh let me share that they were creating a new division called Caribbean Shores. Mm -hmm. That wasn't there in 79. And so Manuel Esquivel stepped into that and that was how he became the prime minister. I would want to think that if the United Democratic Party wanted Darrell Bradley, and I think they should have, um, they should have um, welcomed his candidacy and made an effort to support a candidacy because he did give people a sense of um, change. Mm -hmm. um, he was very candid about his, his time in, in, in politics. It doesn't mean he was perfect, but I think he left a, a space um, at the City Hall, which showed that he, he, um, he achieved certain successes and had a legacy that people looked up to. In other words, people saw him as a potential leader with a new ideas. As something change. different. Yeah. Pardon me? As something different, as representing yes, as something different. different. As yeah. different from status quo, that it was not yeah. business as usual. What they saw with the rest of them were business as usual. Mm -hmm. In fact, it, it has even been said that one of the reasons why there was a switch to, to the current person who won was because um, the, it, was, they were, it was easy, the elite of the party could easily control. I don't know, time will tell about that. But Darrell brought something different in the eyes of people. Now, there is a redistricting process. Um, in 1983, there was a redistricting. Caribbean Shores came out of it, and um, history, um, and the rest is history. Yeah. So I think in that process, you are now in government. You have a position that you could have made that necessary changes, or even find a way in which to fit him in um, post the convention. But clearly, that was not the intent of the party. And Darrell will have to go back and do his groundwork and to ensure that he builds that party base. Yeah. Remember, um, Gavin and um, Marlene, that it was, it's only 570 people that went to vote, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how many of them vote for themselves or they voted according on behalf of their area reps? What would you exactly. say from your experience? Because it's, it's, more, it's easier to control that 16 or so, I think it, it works out to both because it's 496 delegates comes out of the, thir the, the um, 31 constituencies. So it's an average of 16. Um, I think so it's easier to control that 16 than to control the wider, um, a wider base. The People's United Party, for example, have 2,700 delegates. That's not an easy um, <laughs> amount to try to control. So clearly, in a case where there is more, you may have the opportunity for people to more vote for, for, for who they like and who appeal to them. While the less it is, um, it is easier to control. But then at the end of the day, I always say the will of the people always prevail. Because even when you can control, um, at the end of the day, if they want you out, they want you out. Um, Belize and many countries have a way, um, Marlene and Gavin, to vote out government, that vote in government. Yeah, yep. yeah we hear <laughs> that. that. We hear that all the time. All right, we are, we are out of time. But just out of curiosity, what are you watching the most um, in, the, in the time ahead? Uh, we are officially, we know the candidates um, that are the leaders for both parties. And election may be, as I keep on saying, as early as four months or a little bit later. Yeah. Well, definitely, I think both parts, certain things have now been set. Um, let us give the 72 hours. Remember, it took 72 hours for, in the first convention um, in terms of the, the party leaders' tenure. But give, let's, let's give the next week, two weeks, and you're going to see who are starting to line up. Once you see people starting to line up behind the current leader, that means you will know that they are making some success and they will be moving towards that election on, on within the specified time. Be mindful also that even though the November is five years, there is a, um, um, there is a time period in which um, they, they had to, to, to call that election, which is yeah. beyond that November. So it all depends whether they, they, I think the earlier they lined up, um, you may find the elections is earlier. The longer it takes, that period may be extended. The role of the current leader is going to be very crucial. So one is going to need to watch and monitor 
what he says and what he does. John Saldiva is going to be very key, regardless of what we say. Um, one would have to look at what he's saying. He has always been very public, very candid. Um, and you have to start a take between the lines, and then you'll be able to better analyze. All Politics right. is fluid. Um, Marlene and um, Gavin, it's the art of the impossible. If someone would have asked me earlier last week what would happen in the early part of the week, to me, there were clear instances that it was leading towards John, even slightly. And somewhere between Friday and Saturday, it shifted toward and Sunday. Because things happen at the very last minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very last minute, it shifted. So it, it's a fluid scenario, and we just have to monitor what, what, what is going to happen. Um, we've seen where um, Sir Ellington has expressed his resignation. That puts thick stock which went um, for the PUP in the last um, city council, but in the ICJ went along the lines of the UDP. Um, Pickstock is now certainly up for grabs. Um, and I have no doubt at this point in time, if an election was called, it would lean towards the PUP. But time will tell. We don't know right. what can happen. And politics, like I said, is the art of the impossible. Well, we appreciate you uh, doing this dissection of uh, what's happening behind the scenes with us. Of course, a lot of it is just our speculation and from exactly. your experience um, in working in political parties. Yes. But we do appreciate it nonetheless. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me as usual. All right.